Hello, Saints of God. Uh, welcome to the Open Heavens of Prophetic Conference for the year 2021. I'm truly excited to be with you once more on this um, exalted platform. I uh, would like right off the cuff to acknowledge Pastors Francis and Pastors Chenya Recibo for, again, the opportunity given to me to be able to share God's word with God's people, you know, on this platform. Uh, the Open Heavens platform has actually in the past been a place of real open heavens where a heaven resources the people of God, where direction comes, where strategies are given, and where uh, prophetic revelations are, are, are dispensed to the people of God. I trust that this year's meeting will not be any lesser, you know, in the impact, in the gravitas, you know, of spiritual uh, 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 matter that the people of God will be served. And so um, I'm excited to be here. And uh, the next uh, this session that I will do, perhaps uh, one or two other sessions that I will do also, I will focus on the same theme uh, uh, that God has given to us. But let us start with the point of prayer at this place. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together as a people of God in times like this. In times like this, we are reminded that what we are engaged in and what we are involved in is no mere religion. We are in crisis time in our nation. We are in their situations in the earth. The earth is groaning. The world is in convulsion. The birth pangs have begun. There's a lot of apprehension all over the place. People start failing them for fear. There's confusion. People don't even know what to do. Uh, some are strong today and weak tomorrow. Some are certain today and uncertain tomorrow. And the polity is all in a flux. But thank you because you are God and you are the Lord of the times. No times take you on a ways. No times are, are able to disempower your will from coming to pass. No times are so hideous, so difficult, so perilous that your purposes are arrested or your program you know, are, 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 are unable to go on to fruition. You are Lord of all the times, all the times. You are the Lord of the dark. You are the Lord of the light. You are the Lord of the day. You are the Lord of the night. You are the Lord of, 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 of the winter and the summer, of spring and autumn. And every time is in your hands. And you manipulate all things and you drive all things to your purpose. You have mastered the time. You have, you have subdued them under you. And you're riding the time unto the will of God. The days are coming when there shall be time no longer. And we as the people of God are looking for that time. By the grace of God, we've been elevated above mere uh, random exercises of, of, of a Christian religion to connect into a real God who transacts with a real man or with real men on the face of the earth. We are reminded and we remember that uh, this, what we do with you, what, what, what we have to do with you is no religion. We remember that this is a family affair, that this is life, that what Jesus did was come into the earth to generate, to, 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 to raise unto God sons that would be in his own exactitude, in his own likeness. And that's what we are. And this is all a family affair. We assure our minds of that as we gaze upon you and say, God, talk to us in this time. And people are gathered here in, at the cave at uh, Adulam and then all over uh, the world through the internet and other mediated, um, electronically mediated platform. The people are gathered to hear you, to, to listen to you. We say, speak to us. Let us hear your voice beyond the capacity of a man to articulate words beyond the capacity of a, of a good teacher of the word to teach us. Let us hear that sense of divine announcement, that sense of drama that comes from heaven, that sense of, of, of proclamation that is the throne of God engaging the earth. For we are not alone, and we don't want to do anything alone. We take this very, very seriously, that our transaction with you is real time and is real. So talk to your people, God. I submit to your ability to speak to us right now. I submit to your, to, to, to your, to your desire, your yearning uh, to be the Lord in the midst of us, the Lord who governs uh, by his word and by his light and by his truth. Uh, speak to us again, God. Give us, if it is one thought that enlightens our minds and one impartation that changes our cause in the spirit, one understanding that brings us into greater calibration with truth, one, one, one touch from God that alters how we do life, then do that for us, O oh God. And we'll be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so um, uh, I'm excited about the theme of this year's conference. At first, I was a little bit um, um, apprehensive as to whether or not uh, I have a particular word to give to the people of God. Uh, because when I heard the topic, like I said, 
I thought maybe it's one of those kind of things that uh, Prophet Babs or Pastor Dele Matthews or David Dead or even Reverend K, you know, uh, would be very uh, interested in, uh, um, in in dealing with. It, it didn't seem like uh, those kind of things that I have competency in the spirit uh, to do. Uh, because uh, truly, um, everybody has an offering in God. God has crafted us differently, given us, uh, established us in different thoughts and different paths, and expects us to uh, uh, to minister according to the grace that's in us. And so, um, I was, uh, I did, I wasn't sure, you know, if I had anything to say in this connection. Uh, but uh, through the days, um, I began to open my heart and look at God and see uh, if there's a word of God for the people. And then I have a, a, a certainty. You know, in my spirit as to uh, God wanting to say something to you, you know, through me. And so I'll just yield to the upward ordering arm of the Holy Ghost to enable me bring forth this word and this revelation to you in this uh, season or in this session. Uh, we're looking at the whole issue of the 12 perks of the tree of life. We are concerned with the issue of the whole tree of life. And I think that... Um, God is interested in the tree of life also. Looking at the whole thought of tree of life. Uh, uh, let me start by reading the scriptures in the book of Genesis chapter 2 uh, before I begin to open my thoughts. So Genesis chapter 2 in verse number 8, the Bible says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. We were informed in Genesis chapter 1 in verse number 26 that God said, Let us make man in our image. Remember, these are original intents. Remember, these are original thoughts. These are the, 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 the things that fuel the movement of God in the natural. He says, let us make man. This is intent in our image and after our likeness. The man he had in mind at this point in time, at this point in discourse, is far removed from sin, is far removed from death, is far removed from the fall. God has a clear, unadulterated, untainted idea in his mind. He has a concept when he says, let us make man. And God is moving in a strength to do that thing that he said, let us make. So what is this thing that he calls man? Whatever that thing is or however that thing is, it's going to be a creature that is in the image of God and in the exactitude of God. It is going to be such a high upgraded and elevated spirit having the capacity to carry out this assignment or this task of lording it over the universe. Because God having made man put everything in his hands. So that's the background of this thought. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so God made man in his image. In the image of God, Bible says, created he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, subjugate the earth, subdue it, exercise lordship and dominion, fill this place, flood this place, master this place, bring it to, 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 to produce, slave it, and slave it unto the will of God, and let it produce you know, righteousness on the face of the earth. Now that was a charge. But after he had done that with man, the next chapter says, and God put the man whom he had formed, you know, in this garden called the Garden of Eden that God himself planted. And um, in verse number uh, uh, 15, it, it, it repeats it, And the Lord took the man and put the man into the garden. Now this phrasing is a little curious. Why didn't he say he put man in the garden? He said he put the man into the garden. No. That phrase into, or that, that particular word into, gives me a picture of not just uh, 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 putting a man in a garden, but installing the man in the garden, establishing the man in the garden position. But perhaps we'll get to that. Uh, but he put man into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. Now, hold that in your mind, and let us uh, go back uh, to the planting of the garden. Uh, in verse number five, it says, oh, oh, um, uh, just a minute. Okay, it's verse number 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also 
in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So here we see uh, uh, the beginning of the introduction of the tree of, 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 of life, you know, as it is declared in the scripture. Let me begin right off the cuff by saying that it seems that the whole of the scripture is horizoned by life. Let me say that again. The whole of the scripture from the beginning, from Genesis to Revelation, is horizoned by life. The, 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 the Bible begins with the whole concept of life, and it closes with the whole concept of life. In the beginning, we see a living God who goes about to generate life in the face of the earth. He creates life. He births life. He is bringing things into being, and all of these things that he brought into being are an expression of life, like biological life, plant life, and all of those things, and eventually, he brings the highest life in the created order called man. So here, God is dealing with the issue of life. And then we see right, you know, at, at, at the heart of all things, at the beginning of all things, the tree of life. We see with in relation to man, God breathing into the man the breath of life and man becoming a living soul. So there is life in relation with the beginning and then God put him in a garden and there's there the tree of life. And then if you go to the book of Revelations, in the, in, the, in the opening chapters, you see the whole issue of life again. And then when you go to the closing chapters, chapter 22, you will see again this tree of life surfacing, you know, in the book of Revelation. So if God horizons put at the beginning of the Bible the tree of life, at the opening pages, at the beginning of the plot, the tree of life, and then closes the page with the tree of life, there must be something about the tree of life that is very, very remarkable or that is significant in the divine perspective, in the mind of God. God is interested in the tree of life. And so we want to be interested in the tree of life because in Revelation chapter 2, one of the prof promises that Jesus gave to the overcomer is this. It says, he that overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life that is in the midst of the paradise of God. So in the prophetic promises, of blessings that God that, that, that God has uh, ordained or set aside for those who overcome. He says one of them, I will give to eat of the tree of life. Now the other place uh, in, the, in the end of Revelation says, speaks about people having access to the tree of life or being granted access to the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So what is this tree of life that is such an issue in the mind of God? And what is this tree of life that is such a contention? Because remember, let us go back to the book of Genesis. And then look again on what the Bible says. God decided, determined in that uh, 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 in the beginning of creation, after he had furnished the universe, that right now the next correct thing to do is to make man in our image and after our likeness. And this man is to be fitted with the capacity to govern the earth, to administrate over the universe, to be a priest here, to, to, to mediate the holy right here, to landscape the earth with the, with the patterns and blueprints of heaven, to exercise government here, to cause the earth to produce according to the will of God, to make the earth to sing unto God, to make the, the, the fruit of the earth, the fruitage of the earth, ring with glory unto God, to cause everything on the earth to say glory to his name. That was the assignment of man. But man had to be a kind of person in order to do that. And so the Bible says God breaks into the nostrils of man the breath of life and then man became a living soul. So we see there a kind of being called a living soul man. So Adam, the first man, was a living soul. Now we do know of course that uh, the living soul is not what the image and likeness of God is. Because the image and likeness of God, which of course we're talking, we're, we're talking about Christ Jesus, is a life-giving spirit. He's not a living soul. So when it says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, man was in the image of God, but man was not yet fully in the likeness of God. Man had to undertake a spiritual evolution, some growth, some development, something to move him into that place. Because it is not going to be an estate that is bestowed. It's going to be something that has come into. It's going to be something that is, that, that, is, that is taken by the act of obedience. The pathway to arriving at that, the way that Jesus Christ came fully, you know, into the, 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 the fullest possession of all that the Father is. The fullest expanse of all that the Father is. Was upon the platform of obedience was by self-abnegating himself to his own will, was by dirtying himself to his own person, his own essence, and choosing to make God his call. God, Jesus arrived at that place through a process in the spirit. Okay, perhaps uh, 
I have assumptions that uh, uh, some of you might understand what I'm saying you know, in this connection and maybe uh, you just may not. So let me take a little step backward to establish one or two thoughts and then hopefully I'll continue from there. Um, from the first of firstness, there is God. In the beginning, the Bible says God. So you, you cannot talk about the beginning before God. But the truth is, before the beginning that we see in the book of Genesis, there is God. There was a time, and you can't even say there was a time because it was not a time. There was, but let, let's, let's, because I don't know how else to say it. There was a time when there was nothing, and when even nothing was not in existence, when there was nothing but God. When there was no other creature, there was no other God, there was nothing else in being, there just had to be God. When God is a self-existent, uncreated essence within himself, when God is, and because God is first, and he says, I'm the Lord, there is none else beside me. In fact, there's none beyond me. When God, God, God being God, had nothing from which to derive his being, had no, had no reference point you know, from whence he came. He didn't come from nothing. He just is in a way that none of us understands that. If he is, and nothing else is, and then eventually there will be other things that will be, then he had, the honor is upon him, the responsibility is upon him to be the creator of all things and to be the one who gives existence and gives meaning and gives life to all things. And so we see God in his responsibility, taking responsibility, I mean in the beginning, taking responsibility for the universe to be the source of all things. So everything that is, came, has its origin in God. He didn't just create, he gave life. He brought forth life. So he is the genesis and the origin of life, yes? Okay, but this God that we're talking about exists in three persons that our Trinitarian doctrine uh, teaches us. That there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Ghost. And how these three are one, uh, and yet they are three separate persons, uh, stay beyond the, 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 the can of our own natural understanding. We just know that it is so. Uh, it does not make sense a lot of times, but we just know that it is so. That there is a son and there is a father. Now, the thing about the son is that he is co-equal with the father. He is co-essential as the father. He is equally uncreated as the father. He is all that the father is. As a matter of fact, the way the Bible describes him in Pauline Revelations is that he is the fullness of God the Father. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the sole expression of the infinitude of God. He is the embodiment of the totality of the Father. He is the, the scripture says in the book of Hebrews that he is the image of the Father. He is the express image of his person. He is the exactitude of his representation. The Father is in him and he is in the Father. They are so intertwined, but he is an expression because God is spirit, John chapter 4. And Jesus said, no man had seen God at any time. God is spirit. God dwells in unapproachable light. God has chosen to, to dwell in thick darkness. Uh, God is uh, 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 the only immortality. He dwells in light. No man had seen him. No man can approach to him. These are the realities in relation to God. But in the beginning, in the first of firstness, when God is, God is Father. God did not later become Father after he generated his son. The scripture calls him in Isaiah the everlasting father or the eternal father. So he's eternal. His fatherhood is eternal. God has always been father because God has always had a son. If we can say, using shadow, yes, shadow speech, then when God is in being, he is in being as a father because when he is in being, he's at, at once in being with, with the son and at once in being with the Holy Ghost. He, the, the Holy Ghost being, you know, in our understanding, the spirit of God. So as... As God cannot be without his spirit, so he was not without his son. The son was not later generated out of his person. The son is immediately generated out of his person. The son is an essential component of the father. The son is still being generated out of the person. In a realm, in that realm of God that is beyond our three-dimensional uh, capacity to, 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 to imagine. So, from the first of firstness, God is father. And God as a father is basically in his essential nature, love. If love is love, love must express himself. He's unfettered, he's not bound, and he's not restrained by anything. He must live his life. And love lives his life by loving. So love must have something to love. And so love has the son to love. So the, 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 the father is originally, intentionally, primary in his nature, in his essence, pure love. And so he loves. Now the son who is the, the immediate recipient of the love must have the capacity also having the same nature as the Father for love. But the nature of the Son's love is a love that receives from the Father. And so when the Father gives love to the Son, the Son responds you know, to the love of the Father by loving the Father back in, in, in return. But this is the drama of the Son's love. When the Son is conscious of being a Son, he says to himself, I will do my Father's will. 
I will be a son of the Father indeed. And the son actually means one who emanates from the Father, one who proceeds from the Father, one who looks to his Father as the greater one, one who, who, who considers his Father the, his source, the source of his life. In other words, the whole concept of sonship is a sham. Sonship actually means that one, that, uh, uh, one, is, one has a source from somewhere. Sonship actually means that one is sustained from somewhere. So, for example, if I say that I am John's father, it implies that John came from me, that John derives from me, that something about me, you know, was a part of John's formation, and apart from me, John would not be in being, okay? So, Jesus Christ, in saying that he is the father's son, actually then says automatically that his source is the father, meaning that I came from the father. So, in the divine mind, he recognizes that I am not my own person, I do not stand upon my own core. I do not pivot upon my own being. Myself is not the center of all things. I have another center which is deeper than me. And that center is God. And if God is my source, then I am not apart from him. And if I am not apart from him, then whatever I am must serve his being. And so Jesus understands the whole principle of sonship in its elemental principles. That I am not my own man. I am not a self-made man. I am not a self-made person. At this point, he must choose whether he actually wants to pivot upon his car, whether he wants to be the master of his life, the regent of all his actions, the, the, the one who controls his destiny and where he's going, whether he's going to make his own will, his own desires, his own wants, his own ambitions, his own potentials and capacities to be the master of all that he does, or whether he is going to stay with the Father and let the Father's will concerning him the Father's pleasure concerning him, the Father's desire concerning him, and the Father's very life be his own life. Well, Jesus chose from the first of firstness to debt himself to his own self and then to make the Father his source and to make the Father his life. And so by self-abnegating, he plunges into the depth of his own nature and then there creates another kind of life called sonship. Called son and sonship simply means uh, 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 so, 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 so right now, under the thing that, is called, that we call sonship, uh, God is our Father in that he is the father of our creation but jesus is the father of our life jesus is the only reason why we can call god father because initially we're not connected to god you know in in, in that wise okay so from the first of firstness when jesus debted himself you know to god and then said that god would be his source god would be his life god would be the, the fountain of his existence he would spring from god and he would come from god and jesus made god you know, the, 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 the source of everything that, that he is. Now, Jesus Christ, um, who, as the Bible says, as the Father had life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in him also. So, as the Father has life, how does the Father have life? Um, originally, uh, not by importation, by that which is generated within his own being. It's a self-existing life, a self uh, generating life and all of that. He's given the Son to have that self-generating capacity. So Jesus Christ is a spirit that has the capacity to give life. As the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in him and to whomsoever he wills. So we see the profile of the Son as a life-giving spirit. Now when God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let him have dominion, it was clear that what he meant by man is Jesus. It's, it's some, something like Jesus. He's looking at the Son. He's looking at, the, at that, because Paul says in the book of, of, of Timothy that Jesus is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So he refers to Jesus as the man. He is the man. He is the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, so God in saying, let's make man, had Jesus in view because Jesus is the image of the Father, Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus is the exactitude of God. He is the semblance. He's everything. He puts a face on God. He manifests God. So God was looking at Jesus and saying, I want this person reproduced. I want this person becoming the seed for bringing many sons unto glory. This is beyond a religious ambition. God is not immediately looking for worshippers. God is not immediately looking for, 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 for chorus singers, for ushers, or for, 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 for people who will uh, 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 do evangelism and all that. That is not the thought in his mind. Immediately, God is saying, I am so delighted in this son, as this son has the capacity to absorb all of me within himself and to express me, and I can live my life out through him. I live in the son. I, the son lives by me. My life flows out of him. I want a, a, a family of many sons, just like Jesus Christ, having the capacity to sponge me into their, 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 their beings 
and to express my infinite life out of them. These sons are going to get an inheritance each from me. The inheritance would be myself. The inheritance would be that portion of me that will be given to them, that will be so infused with them that it will live in them and express itself and flow out of them. I will give them an inheritance. And the greatest inheritance I can ever give to them is not anything in relation, I mean, in the, in the realm of my power or my riches or my money or this or that. The greatest thing that I can give to them is myself and so I will put myself in them. I will put a portion of myself in them and I will elevate them in that portion of myself to something that is beyond a created a created being. They will come into that realm of, 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 of almost being like uncreated because of their union with me. These are the thoughts in the heart of God. These are the lofty thoughts of love. Love wants to elevate man. Love wants to take man somewhere. Love wants to take man to the highest height of his being. The highest height that is, 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 is not possible ordinarily to be and so he begins with creating a living soul but in his mind this living soul must graduate to become a life-given spirit this is going to be a major chiropractic modification in the inner structure of the man this is going to be an upgrade in the kind of being that the man is the man is going to move away from something created to something that is uncreated something that is born something generated from within God the transition is going to take place but it's going to be a transition of love it's going to be based on the decision of a man because you see Jesus became what he was or became the father of our sonship by his own decision. The decision to love the father back. The decision to die to himself. The decision to make God the core of his life, the center of his life. The decision to, to, to not have a life outside of God, to be totally dependent upon God. This was Jesus' decision. This is how that son, the sonship of Christ, was born. And so the sonship of man has to be born in the same way. There has to be the platform for obedience. There has to be a platform to choose because love is not love if it's coerced. Love is not love, it is if it is forced. Many people ask the question if God knew that there's going to be so much evil in the earth and there will be death and that man will sin, why did he still put the, the tree of, of, of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Why not make it impossible for man to have a choice? Why not put the railings on the path? Why not why did he even give man a will? I know that God had to give man a will because God was trying to generate a person. That is like Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is a creature, is, 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 is not a creature, is a being that has a will, is a being that has a capacity to respond to God. God didn't want zombies. God wanted people who would love him. And if the if if I am um, if it is not possible for me not to love him, then what I have will not be love. What I have will be a program. He didn't want to, to program men, you know, to, 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 to love him. He wanted men to choose to love him because within themselves, they see what he is. They like what they see. They, 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 they enjoy what they see. They, 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 they think this is totally awesome and there's nothing greater than that. And then they love. God wanted us to love and that's why up to now, the greatest commandment in the scripture is still that commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you will you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, you see, that was supposed to be uh, like a commandment, but the love cannot be commanded in the heart of people. This is what the Lord says. He says, when he commands them, he's saying, This is what I will for you. This is what I desire of you, or so to say, but God, you know, could not force them to keep the commandment. If a man says, Well, I don't want to love him, or I don't, I, I, I really don't love him, I don't care for him, God was not going to bring down the hammer on his head and say, and then bash him and all of that. But he would not be unable be, be able to rise into the height of the kind of person that he could be. And so Jesus Christ became what he was through conscious self-abnegation, through death to himself, through choosing the Father, through loving the Father. And so if man must migrate from this living soul to becoming a life-giving spirit, there has to be a choice made to love God, to submit, to say no to his own, the potential of a different life within himself, to make God the regent of his life, the core of, of, of his being, the, 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 the person upon which he pivots, you know, all of his activities. God has to be that in man. And so that was the, that was the drama that we see in the book of Genesis chapter 1. God puts uh, uh, man immediately in the presence of two trees. Of course, there were other trees that were for the nourishment of the physical body, but the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, these are trees that have the capacity to affect man in his soul and in his spirit. And so the other trees were actually trees to, uh, like herbs and all of those things to nourish the physical body of a man because God created man with a body you know, to operate upon the face of the earth. And so man is faced with this choice you know, of choosing this or that. Actually, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was never meant to be a choice. 
you know, in that sense, because God had already indicated that um, eat all of these things freely, I mean freely, but just don't eat that. But of course, like, like we know, uh, man disobeyed God and went and ate that. And I, was, I was asking myself a question. Uh, God said, uh, uh, in the day that you eat of this tree, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And then man ate that day, and then man did die. Uh, of course, not in his body, uh, but uh, first of all in his spirit, and then uh, immediately in his soul, and continuously in his soul, he began to experience that separation from God, that withering away from God's essence, from God's uh, 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 um, uh, prescribed way for him to exist in. So man died. Now I'm asking myself the question, uh, what is it that killed man? Is it the disobedience to God that killed man? Or is it something in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that killed man? And I'll submit to you today that it was the content of the knowledge of good and evil, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that killed man. Why? Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, uh, is the origin of, of religion. Is the origin of um, a consciousness that enables you to know that this is right and this is wrong and does not fuel you with the capacity to choose the right and to do it. Just like the law. So we have in a part, you know, the figure of the law placed before Adam and Eve, the law and grace. So if the, the tree of life would be grace, then the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil would be the law. Uh, because uh, like Paul said in the book of uh, Romans chapter 3, it says, for by the law, is the knowledge of sin. He says in Romans chapter 7, he says, I did not know sin before the law. He said, I was alive without the law. That they had life in me. But when the commandment came, something revived inside of me. Sin revived and I died. He said, I, I was innocent. I didn't know Jack. My, 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 my work was pure. It was, it, was, it was without condemnation. I didn't know that perhaps uh, uh, concerning loss until the Lord said to me, thou shalt not lose. The knowledge of loss was introduced to my mind. Previous to this time, I lived in a world that was free from offenses. But this law came and then began to activate in me the understanding that this is right and this is wrong and this is what to do. But the problem with the law is that the law was not able to empower anybody to do the law. No man by reading the law was able to keep the law. But the law is the knowledge of, of, I mean, is the knowledge of sin. The problem with the law was the law just told you, but the law didn't, did not supply. And so Paul said, you know, later on, he in, in chapter, uh, uh, Romans chapter 7, he says, I find in me the will to do what is right. He says, I, 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 a desire to do what is right is in me. He said, but I do not find the power to do that thing because all I have is just a knowledge of what is right and what is wrong and within me a, 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 a desire a, something lifting up something rising up to want to do it but finding but failing in the capacity to do it that's exactly what the tree of of the knowledge of good and evil did for adam it opened his eyes to a consciousness adam now knew adam now became conscious of something adam could now choose to live in a certain way or to to do this or to do that but it is clear uh, from the scripture that um, God did not uh, want, uh, 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 or he was not looking for well-behaved Christians, you know, who are moral, who do things right. We've turned the whole issue of Christianity into an issue of morality. And so, so, am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? Am I doing that? And, and some of us have to severe mind from that whole thing. That uh, don't, we're, we're, we're not given a, li a license for anybody to sin or for anybody to continue to do you know, the things that are, that are contrary to the scriptures. But uh, God's, what he was looking for from the start is not uh, morality. He's not looking for how much you can stay in, in line. How much you can do what is right. How much you can be uh, uh, not not smoke or not womanize or not drink, drink beer and all those things. That's not immediately what he's looking he's looking at. He's looking for one who can express his life, one in whom he can he can occupy, you know, and then live his life through. One who can enjoy the essence and the person and the nature of God. He wants the, the his nature to live inside of us. And that is the biggest thing in Christianity. But we have not mastered that in our Christian religion. We have warned the people about the dangers of doing wrong and the dangers of doing right. And we have made people who can do right, you know, to understand that this is what God is totally pleased with and this is what God really wants. 
But uh, ultimately, um, what God wants is bigger than just morality. What God does want, you know, is people who can express the life of God. Well, um, I'm going to stop this video at this point here. And in the next uh, video, by the grace of God, I'm going to stay upon the issue of the tree of life and expand it a little more. I hope that somehow you have found value in your heart to found foundation, uh, I mean, sufficient foundation to understand that what God really wants with us and what, what God really desires is not immediately, you know, a uh, 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 people who have a, a moral compass, a people who 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 who, who, who judge their sense of of importance to God or their sense of well-being, their sense of aliveness with how much they've been able to do something right or something correctly. But it goes deeper than that. God wants a people who incline towards life and in whom he can express his life. I'll, exp I'll, I'll expand upon this in the next video. God bless you.